Thanks, Josh. We're all happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to be with this panel. We've got three great editors um, who've cut a, t a bunch of great, interesting films, that um, three of which we're going to discuss today. Um, before we get started, I, um, I run the Karen Schmier Film Editing Fellowship, and we started about eight years ago uh, in honor of our friend Karen Schmier, who was a documentary film editor and, um, and also a, a fantastic person. She uh, edited about 12 films, uh, eight of them premiered at Sundance. Uh, she worked a lot with Errol Morris. She worked on The Fog of War, Mr. Death, uh, with Rob Moss on The Same River Twice. Uh, she won the Sundance Editing Award for Sergio with Greg Barker as the director. And uh, in 2010, she was tragically killed, um, actually on the Upper West Side here, uh, by a hit and run driver in, a, in, a, in an accident. And so we wanted to um, turn that into something good and honor her memory. And we started an editing fellowship. And uh, for the last eight years, we've chosen one emerging documentary editor a year and given them uh, something we believe is really important and oftentimes uh, missing in the, in the digital world that we live in and work in, uh, which is mentorship. So we match the editor up with three veteran mentors, send them to festivals, um, and give them some other benefits. And uh, our fellow this year is Kristen Bai. She edited Obit, the film about the New York Times obituary writers. And this year we're starting a new program. It's called the Diversity in the Edit Room program. Uh, we recognize that the edit room has traditionally been a pretty homogenous place. And we want to change that and do what we can to change that. So we have chosen 29 mentees from a diversity of backgrounds and experiences and we're matching them up with mentors. So they're going to meet in groups with mentors for the next year and um, we'll try to introduce them to people they don't already know and, and with each other hopefully um, learn and talk about the art and craft of the business. So, um, and I want to thank Manhattan Edit Workshop because uh, from the beginning of our fellowship they've been uh, one of our strongest supporters and uh, we appreciate them for all the help they give us. So without further ado, here's our panel. And actually, Brian Chang is one of our diversity mentees this year. So it's, it's a real treat to have him on the editing panel. Um, so uh, briefly, each of our panelists has brought one clip, like I said, from a film uh, or film series that they've worked on. We're going to show and talk about each clip one by one with them. And then after that, we'll open the conversation up a little bit more to general issues about editing and, and maybe refer back to the work or the films that we've already talked about. And, um, and then towards the end of the panel, we'll open it up to you all and take some questions from you. So it's the beginning of the panel. Let's talk about beginnings. And before we talk about um, the clips, uh, let's talk about the beginning of the edit job or the edit process. Um, as with any creative endeavor, I think uh, it can be hard to get started. And uh, a lot of, uh, I think people could benefit from hearing how you guys approach the beginning of an edit. Um, what do you, what does it feel like in those first few weeks? What do you like to do? What do you focus on? How do you organize yourself and your approach to the material? Anybody want to go first? Uh, okay. Um, it, it's my least favorite part of the edit by far um, because you have sometimes six or seven hundred hours of footage and you have no idea how to tackle it. And um, I think my answer to this question has changed over time. I think at first what I really like to do was um, take everything and slowly whittle it down over time and sort of make selects. And ha I had this a tiered system where I would you know, have a, everything would be on V1, video would be on V1 and then A1 and A2. And then if I liked a clip, I would raise it up a section. I would raise it up to one for decent, two for uh, very good, and then three for this is incredible. And then four would be like, you know, this is going in the movie no matter what. And that's what I did for a while. And now I think just because of schedule, I just start cutting. And that's pretty much the polar opposite of it. I, I just, I think that, um, no matter no matter how you approach it, you're you're going to have to get to a, a rough cut. Is, is, I guess I guess this is what it is. Is what's changed is the faster I can get to a rough cut, the better. And I try to start making my first mistakes 
as quickly as possible. And so that's why I really like to cu start cutting scenes because I sort of think of editing as a process of, it's a weird way of putting it, but it's a, it's a process of failure in a lot of ways, right? Because you're, you're just not getting it right and not getting it right, and then eventually you do, and that's what the movie is, kind of. So the faster that I can get to those first mistakes, the better, is the way I view it now. So, uh, so what do you say when somebody says, do you watch, I mean, it sounds like you're answering this question, but do you watch all the footage before you start cutting? I mean, people talk about that, so it no, sounds like I, you're I, not. I try not to. I mean, now, I, I, this is, I did, the thing that we're going to watch is a film series. I've done two film series back to back now, and the interesting thing about it, film series is that you work with uh, story producers a lot. And I have found, that I, I, the last person I worked with, Dallas Rexer, um, one of the most talented people I've ever worked with. Um, and I went from, I mean, I've never worked faster. I've never, it, it, it's a very liberating experience if you allow it to be because there's just somebody telling you like, you know, th like these are the five or six scenes that we're gonna try to edit. Let's just go for them. And you just get cooking. And like at first, I think, I think like five years ago, I would have been terrified of that process because I wanted to say like, there's this, there's this nugget on a, uh, of sound on a lav track that's like buried that, that you know, is where, where the shaky camera is. And I just have to hear every little bit of sound. But um, you discover those things still in the process of scanning around for footage when you're trying to find something later or after the fact. And just getting to it is, is now my preferred method for, for what it's worth. I should say um, Matthew edited The Fourth Estate that's on Showtime, and there's four episodes. It's a total of four and a half hours. Yep. Is that right? That's right. And there were, um, were there five editors credited? Uh, that sounds right. I may have watched and, it more and recently. I, I basically yeah. cut the first one, which was a 90-minute was a ninety minute first episode. Um, and this method that I'm talking about is particularly helpful because I had... I had, I think, 14 weeks to cut a 90-minute uh, film, basically, and so you can't you can't watch all the footage, and you and and a lot of time, a lot of it is just, you know, how are we going to make, you know, what do we think the scenes are? Again, like let's get to the part where this is a horrible rough cut as quickly as possible, so that we can just start making it better, and um, I don't know, I found that it works. And uh, I want to say Anne Collins edited um, Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold, that's on Netflix. And Brian edited uh, Narco Cultura, which is also on Netflix. And th those are the films, they edited many more films, but those are the films we're going to talk about today. Uh, do you guys have anything to add about where you like to start and how you like to start? Yeah, um, it was really interesting hearing you say that, Matthew, because I find that over the years my process has gone kind of in the opposite direction. I, I've um, you know, similar to you, raising selects onto V1, V2, et cetera. Um, but after that initial phase of uh, talking to the director about what characters we want to focus on, kind of big ideas, once I'm pulling those selects, um, I find that my, my system is more and more granular, that, I, that I'm tagging it like very specifically, and I'm, I'm pulling selects, like editing it in my mind a little bit to be like, okay, well, here's like the, here's the opening shot, and here's like, the main piece, and, and so that if I compress those V1, V2s down, that, that's basically the rough cut. But I'm, I'm keeping detailed notes to myself so that if we ever have to go back and recut a scene or you know turn it into something else, I, I still have like my initial baseline reaction to the overall footage that I can go back to. Um, whereas the, the, if you just, it's really tempting to start editing right away and cut a really bad scene right away, but often I find that that locks me into how that scene was cut initially, and then, you know, once you get the whole story arc together, it might be that, you know, we want to use completely different VO for this section, or you want to, like, you know, put it into a montage instead of a slow-paced verite thing, um, and to have those shots laid out that, that I pulled initially, I can always go back to that, whereas if I haven't pulled those carefully, it could be footage that I, you know, watched months ago, and I go back, and I'm like, I don't, I don't remember anymore exactly where that shot was. But if I was careful and meticulous the first first time through, I find that, that saves a ton of time further down the line. So I would say about starting, there are two things I always think about when I um, sit down to start a project. That first day is always a little funny because the system isn't working, or the, you know, there's always problems. But I, I always like to think. Um, you know, I've been cutting films for a long time, but I 
feel like every project is a new project and a new beginning. And I like to remind myself that I might have cut other films, but I've never cut this film before. So I let go of all of the other films and I let go of you know, anything that might have happened. And I try to really kind of center myself and I try to be very, very humble in front of this story. Um, and I, I, on the first couple of day, first day, first couple of days, I like to really think about the fact that there's a story in this system that wants to be told and it's for me to be quiet and let it start speaking to me. Um, so that's my first thought. My second thought, because it's terrifying, because I feel like usually on the first day of a project, I go in and I sit down and I kind of go, ah, and then I hear, do you have a rough cut yet? <laughs> do you have a rough cut yet? It's usually the producer, although I love producers. Um, you know, hi, we have to see something. Can we talk about schedule? Because we were thinking we could send something out in about two weeks. How's that? You, there's that. So, you know, you have to silence the crazy, you know, um, all around you uh, to allow the creative to happen. Um, and what I say and what I stick to, and it's for anybody who's knocking on my door, but it's mostly for myself, is that it's a process. And it's not a process I invented. It's a process that's developed over the past hundred years as we've been making films. And I, I honor the process and I stick to the process because I feel like that will get me through um, and that the various steps of that process lead to creativity and lead to insight and lead to a groove in which I can work and which you know, a story can emerge. Um, so that's very theoretical. But what I actually like to do is I open up the bins, I have them logged by my assistant, and I make um, select bins for each scene. And if, it's, if there are interviews happening, I make selects for each person's interview, and I subclip. I don't do a string out, I do subclips, and I rename the subclips, because you can do that. Um, and I put notes into those so that months from, you know, or weeks or months later, I can, sometimes I subclip so that I can sort like cutaway or whatever. But I mostly put story beats into the titles of those subclips so that it's the scene of like, you know, the editing panel, right? And I have moments that I can remember that I might forget about precisely because that first cut of a scene might not be the right cut. Like you might cut one scene one way and then all of the other scenes need it to be something different and you have to completely rethink it and it's those early notes, those first impressions that I think pay off in the end. Although I totally loved hearing what you had to say because schedules are, because you know, it's, when can we say a rough cut? There's that, there's that. But I, I try to allow for the process. Matthew, do you think it w the next indie doc, you know, hour and a half film that you get a chance to cut, if it's 200 or 300 hours, do you think you'll change the way you're working right now on these series? Or you're loving it? I really like it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it it's you're not, you're not having a nagging, uh, what am I missing? You're I over that. I always find that there's a, I, 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 am nor I mean, who knows, maybe there's, you know, a 10 times better cut of you know, the first episode of The Fourth State. But uh, no, I really, I really feel like I'm still finding all the nuggets as I'm going through. And um, you're, always, you're always still scrubbing through stuff towards the end. Right. And I guess I, I, I feel like I'm coming across it then. And, and I have to change them. I mean, I th that's the truth is that like I would, I, I'd say there's probably stuff that I was finding in the last two weeks of before Picture Lock. And I was saying like, this needs to go in. And, and I might have found that earlier. Uh, right, I just watched right. everything right away. So, But I, I think that's important too that even no matter how you're setting up your process, the fact that you go back into the footage is, yeah. it's always no matter what you say at the beginning, you just need something different later on into the cut. So the idea that you're, you know, I, I make all the subclips and I label them, but then I often jump back into the dailies and scrub through and find things and, you know, something that you see one day that doesn't seem relevant, you know, cuts later can be exactly what you're looking for and you ju it just didn't jump out with you that way. So that's probably where the process is. It's, it's not just the first day, it's like the whole, the whole event, the whole journey, right? <laughs> All right, let's move on to our first uh, clip. So we're gonna look at um, Anne's clip from Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold First. Um, let's set it up a little bit. Um, so Anne, we, the film of course is about Joan Didion. Um, but tell us a little bit about the director of the film and the materials that you guys had to work with. Okay. So Joan Diddy and the Center Will Not Hold was made by Griffin Dunn, who is a feature filmmaker and actor, and also Joan Didion's nephew, um, and brilliant and wonderfully talented and hilarious. Um, so 
uh, we had Joan's cooperation in making the film. She was really happy to have the film made, and we had complete access to anything she had written in her lifetime. And she's a very prolific writer. She's in her 80s, so we had 15 very thick books, mostly thick books. We had every article. I had her high school graduation speech. I had her, um, her essay for her application to Stanford. I had everything she'd ever written, and that was part of the material in addition to um, archival footage of her, photographs of her, she was photographed a lot, many, many interviews, um, and any archival footage I could dream up or Griffin could dream up, anything we could think of to kind of illuminate uh, what we were working with. So it was a vast amount of material you know, in the project, but there was even more material on the bookshelf next to me. And so what Griffin and I did uh, starting in the months before we began editing is we read all of her work chronologically from when she wrote it. We started with things she'd written as a child and we read everything through to um, Blue Nights and then she published a book while we were working so we had to read that, read that one too. That's a lot of material to it read. It was a lot of material and every night when I got home we were going to talk about the balance of like work and life. When I would get home at night after I ate dinner and everything was quiet and my life was somewhat taken care of, I would get into bed and I would read more Joan Didion um, in preparation for what I might need to know the next day or what we were working on that week and I would just every night I, you know, I like I have to say, I would like roll over my sleeve and be dreaming about Joan Didion. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. So and you were getting and you were getting paid during this process. I was getting paid to read Joan yeah. Didion. It was I was really happy. <laughs> I was really happy. So it was a lot of material. Um, and you know, the interesting thing about the film is that when you're making a film about a family member, there's a great deal of tenderness, um, and there's a, a great deal of sort of um, chaotic memory about that person. And so one of the challenges was to try to take a very long life full of changes and accomplishments and loss and figure out a narrative through line um, that kind of gave it a little bit of shape. So, And so, okay, so let's set up the, the opening clip. Um, briefly tell us about some of the challenges and I think after we show the clip, let's talk about some of the other things that you tried to get into the film. And um, so the challenge in making this was, and then we'll show what you wound up doing. So the challenge, the challenge. So the challenge in making this was we wanted to um, in making this clip. Or yeah, I think. Yeah, how, how? Yeah, how are you going to get well, us into the film and tell us the rules, kind of? So I would say the thing about beginnings is I find that beginnings are the hardest part of the film, and they're the part of the film that changes the most often for me. That you think, you know, sometimes I start a project and the director is saying we know exactly what our beginning is. We shot something, and this is how it's going to begin. But as the film evolves, that beginning changes a lot. And some of the things that I try to think about in beginnings are, you know, if you really think about it when you're watching a film, it's a different universe with different rules than the ones we live by, right? There are some people and you only see their heads, or there are jumps in time, or there are voices, or there's music, you know, there isn't music right now in this moment, right? Or should there be music right now? I don't know. But you know, there are a lot of things that we take for granted and we, we believe that our reader will read them. But in fact, if you don't sort of set the universe the right way and kind of establish your voice and establish your style, it feels muddy and it's hard to kind of get into the story. So that's one of the things you have to kind of accomplish in the first few minutes of the film is what, you know, stylistically, is this a verite world? Is it a very shaky world? Is it a very smooth world? And why? And what emotionally is pulling you in? And what? You know, what's that once upon a time? Once upon a time what? Once upon a time the whole world was on fire or something like that. So there's a lot of business that gets taken care of in the first few minutes of the film. And it has to be, in, of any documentary or any film, and it has to be taken care of invisibly and silently. And you have to make this tacit agreement with your reader that they're in good hands, with your viewer, that they're in good hands and that they should come with you. So that's, you know, that's why it changes all the time. Okay, great. So uh, let's watch that. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. There's a lot packed in there, and it's all rushing back to me, of course, because I'm sitting here, right? Yeah. I imagine were there versions where that 
I mean, we got we got up to her 20s in the first maybe five minutes. She's yeah. 20 years old. There were maybe versions where that was longer because we got a lot more to go about her. About her life, yeah. right? Exactly. Well, we, um, you know, uh, probably her most famous book is Year of Magical Thinking. That's probably got the widest readership, and that's a book about her husband suddenly passing away while their daughter is have is is um, in a medically induced coma. It's a really good book, but um, and it's about grief. And at first, I thought, oh well, maybe we should start with that. So we had we started with you know we'll start with year of magical thinking and then go back in time, but then it kind of colored everything that happened. You were like, oh, and they're gonna die. Everybody's <laughs> gonna die. Like there there could not be a single moment of joy in the film when we opened with that. There was also there is a lot kind of packed into that because Joan, the pro the the beginning of the project started when um, Joan's publishers wanted her to make some videos because writers have to have videos now on websites and she said well if you have to make a video I want Griffin to direct it and Griffin said oh I'll direct it and so that's where the footage of her reading her book comes in and the footage of her kind of sitting looking at Vogue that was all shot like for me it was archival footage although Griffin had shot it it was shot for her publishing company so I had footage of her reading her books which is a little bit like that had to be introduced in just the right way. And then I have um, interviews, you can hear some interviews with her, then there's a formal interview with her. And then there were things, she's quite old now and she would not read anything else for us. She was like, I'm not doing it, because she smoked all her life, so her voice is really, you know. Um, anyway, she wasn't gonna do it. She was like, I'm done, you can make this film, you have oodles. Um, <laughs> so. So some of her books, like sometimes I would read something and I'd be like, oh, I want that part and you didn't film it. So we had to solve that problem too. Um, and the way we solved it is, um, I hope this is making sense. We had people who knew her, people who were close to her read passages of her book. So when the film begins and we're in San Francisco, you later learn that's actually her editor who's one of her closest friends reading her work. Um, the other thing about Joan Didion, like all of us, is that her voice changes over time. So I have archival interviews with her where she's in her 20s and she's got this Southern California accent that's like largely disappeared from Southern California and her voice is much higher and much more girlish and it's got a lilt in it. And then I have her in her 40s, I have her in her 60s, and now I have her in her 80s. And it's a different accent and a different voice every time. So how to introduce the idea that her voice might change, you know, I knew I needed to do that up front. I had to throw Griffin in because I, it was important for us to um, be clear that there was a relationship between the filmmaker and the subject, so he's in in the beginning. We're moving through archival, you know, we're moving through her past. There's um, archival and interview of her talking about her past, but then there's archival that's kind of um, illustrating her writing, and that's all kind of in those first couple of minutes. And there's several um, elements that also suggest Without, without going to the year of magical thinking, but suggest a sort of ominous, haunting, yes. things are dark Yes. Uh, from the song you picked. I love that song. Did that take a while to figure out you're going to use canned heat? You could have used any song from the late 60s. You know, it was just one of those, it was such a nice collaboration. I was um, putting down shots of um, San Francisco once, you know, we sort of said, let's start with San Francisco. I was laying down the shots of the Golden Gate Bridge and Griffin was, behind me there was like a couch and a desk and Griffin was back there and he's a person who has headphones growing out of his head and he looked up and he went what about this and he just <laughs> played it. it was like the first cue that we put in and we loved uh, it and you know it was yeah. just but this was after you know nine months of editing yeah that that kind yeah of right like it just popped it just in after nine months but uh, it so seems it was, like it was always there right but we used it like a couple of those choices in the very beginning I'll say um, uh, for Griffin, as her nephew, who's extremely close to her, and as the filmmaker, it was very, very important that he established that she is like the coolest person he's ever mm. met in his life. Mm -hmm. And she is the mm -hmm. coolest person in the world. Um, so we wanted really cool music for her. We didn't want um, some of the music that comes later to open. We wanted to start out from the get-go, like this is one, she's, she's 86, but she's a really cool lady. So that was part of that music choice. Cool. And he, we got to move on, but even the um, the treatment of the title and the typewriter, and then her name is in red, which is that like blood suggestion that blood's yes. going to be on the way, like helter skelter, and right. right. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. She's very dark, so we wanted to push that right up front yeah. that it's not going to be pretty. She's she like like 
like like a fun day for her is to go to um, the morgue and look at bodies. <laughs> you know, she would do that. Even when she wasn't really writing anything about that, so we, we had to put that right up front too. Yeah. All that darkness. <laughs> he did it. Uh, all right, let's move on to Fourth Estate and Matthew. Um, uh, if you can, for us, just briefly describe the, the subject and the structure of the Fourth Estate, please. So it's okay. about the New York Times and about um, the year after Trump was inaugurated, uh, starting on that day and uh, up through a uh, little over a year later, so I think sometime in April. And uh, my episode was the first 100 days. And um, the clip that we're going to watch is the introduction to um, the Russia investigative team. And <clears throat> should we try to talk a little bit about like the th what we were trying to accomplish with it, or before? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's about uh, it's a, about 20 minutes, 21 minutes into the film. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I just was going to mention that even though it's not the beginning of the film, it is the beginning of of the Russia. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you said that. The, the the hardest thing with this. Um, in, it's all the, the same things that you always encounter when you're starting, uh, when you're, you know, sort of beginning a story. You have to introduce all the characters, you have to set everything up, and there's quite a bit of setup in here, more than I think I would normally like to do. Um, but Maybe if you watched all the footage first, uh, yeah, it exactly, wouldn't be so much. Exactly, exactly, thank, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> your spare time. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Wow. Um, so, um, the hardest thing to do with this subject w is, er, is, uh, is to sort of, you have to create stakes for every documentary subject, your, you know, whoever your main character or characters are. And um, one of the things that I've done in the past that I really think, I, ha I think has worked in terms of creating a, a, I don't know, a character is sort of the David versus Goliath um, model, where, and I've, I think, unfortunately, I've had two characters actually say in two separate docs, I'm David and such and such is Goliath. I think it was with the public defender systems and then another, a vigilante in, on, in Arizona, on the Arizona side of the border. Um, but with the New York Times, they're Goliath, kind of. Um, and everybody else around them in a lot of ways is, is David. Um, and I want in terms of sorry, in terms of the business and other papers yeah, and other news yeah, sources, right? Yeah, yeah. And and um, and I remember uh, before I started working on the project, the Washington Post. If you remember back at the beginning of the Trump administration, it was just scooping them left and right. And I remember thinking while that was happening, I was like, this is this is a tremendous way to sort of position them at the beginning of the story as something closer to David. And then I think, I think one of the things that you sort of began to touch on was that um, whatever you do at the beginning of this can really color everything else that comes afterwards. And that, that can happen in a negative way, which is what you were trying to avoid in your example. But in the example that you're going to watch, I sort of felt like the theme of my entire 90 minutes was, was kind of like putting the times on uneasy feeling, uh, uneasy footing, and then also sort of examining what they got wrong in the immediate past. And uh, there's a couple different instances of it, but if, there, if anybody is sort of a fan uh, or the opposite of, of the times, there's the story that was published on October 31st, right before the election, when they said that uh, uh, Trump's, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna screw this up, so forgive me, uh, but basically that Trump had no connection to Russia. That's the he that was what the headline was. The article was far more nuanced. But um, there was this debate about where we were going to put this into the story. Was it going to go later or earlier, blah, blah, blah. And, and what I decided when we were in the middle of the edit was if we put it at the beginning, even though there's all this um, ex exposition at the beginning of the story, because you have to set up you know, what the Russia story is, um, if you put it at the very beginning, it, casts, it, it, it shows what the reporters are going through on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the doubt that they have to, the doubt they have on their own sources, the, how, how much fact-checking they have to go through, and the anxiety that they go through, that they have this sort of looming over them. And so, um, yeah, I think th that's what I was trying to accomplish, basically, in this five-minute clip, so. Cool, uh, let's watch it.
So they got scooped. They got scooped. <laughs> um, the tension in that um, is really palpable. Um, there, there's a tension of wanting to get it right. There's the tension of this being a major story. Um, and uh, you know, one of the, the obvious um, craft ways of doing that is through the music. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm curious, um, how did you guys get to the point of, I know that we'll just say that um, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, is that his name? I think so, yeah. um, they wrote the theme music, right. uh, which sets the tone during the title sequence. Um, they, did the, they won the Oscar for The Social Network, and Trent Reznor, of course, from Nine Inch Nails, so he's got that industrial, dark tone to it. Um, and then uh, Scott Salinas. H. Scott Salinas yeah. uh, was the composer for the, the rest of the series. And I've worked with him now on four projects, probably. Um, he's great. Um, yeah, I mean, we wanted to have that sort of, is, I, I, think, I think one of the things that really helped with this story in particular was to, um, to try to define early on what type of music um, what genre of music or what feeling would be for different stories. So we're with the Russia guys, we're with the general um, white uh, Washington Bureau, um, we're with, it, we're sometimes we're in New York with the, with the headquarters here. Um, and with Russia, I, instead of making it like really snappy and, and like, you know, fast paced, I wanted, it, I, I wanted early on for it to be this very kind of quiet, like slowly moving through the corridors of the times with them and just feeling, and, and in fact, I actually did this, I call it, I mean, it's called like, a, I call it cre putting a creeper zoom, but it's like basically where you take a clip that's steady and you, it starts at 100 and then by the end of the clip, you make it 105 as a zoom. So it just, and that shot, it happens in the shot when they're all in that conference room and they're trying to decide whether or not to run the story, but you just feel like this, this thing slowly coming in towards them as they're trying to make the decision if they're gonna do it. And it's like really little things like that even as much as the music, I think all add to it. But really letting, I think, I think you could have cut this to be really fast paced and really energetic and be like, oh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna get Flynn, you know, it, it could have been like that. But I think the, the tension comes in how slow and how quiet it is and not letting the newsroom get loud in the sound mix and stuff like that too, so. And the color correction too. Yeah. It's, um, it's why do we, what do we say, like the blue subdued, the, yeah. the darks. Especially when we get to the Washington, especially when we get to the exterior and we're slowly moving with through, you know, we start, in each of the scenes, uh, this is getting really geeky, but like, and no, these are things do that it, like, like, literally nobody else will notice except for me. So, but now I get to tell all you about it, so it makes it makes me really happy. But uh, with the there, there's a couple of scenes with Mazzetti, who's the lead uh, investigator, who's the one who's talking most of the time, and in a couple of his scenes, I I tried to start them and end them in the exact same way. So like, this one, he's in the car at the beginning and end. This is so stupid, but uh, anyway, uh, and then in the next one, he he like. He it, when they finally scoop everybody else, they which is the exact next scene. Um, he he comes up in an elevator and then he leaves in the elevator at the beginning and end of the scene. And it's and it, I don't know. Anyway, those are the no, little I things know. that I do to keep myself yeah. <laughs> like, no. happy in the edit room. I guess I but, think uh, we as the viewer appreciate those little things. Who knows? Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. but yeah, but the tension throughout because it's like it's just a bunch of guys. It's 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 a. You know, it's just a bunch of people in in a in an office typing on keyboards, and so yeah. it's interesting though because I did this and I did City of Ghosts, uh, two films before this one, and it's the same thing. It's just like uh, it's uh, th th it's a story. That's a story about these guys who are on the run from ISIS, who sort of um, revealed them in Raqqa, Syria, and and when they're on the run, it's just people in hotel rooms typing on keyboards and making phone calls and stuff like that. But um, in a weird way, it it allows you to create a world and a place because it's so confined, and you can feel the walls sort of shrinking around these people. Um, it, it's of course like in the raw footage, not like the most tense thing, but it really allows you to create a world around it in a, in a way that's different than when you're working on a movie where like people are with guns on the back of trucks or something like that. Um, so I really I enjoyed that part of it. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. We're going to move on now to Brian. We're going to talk about um, Brian's film, Narco Cultura. And um, why don't you do the same thing, Brian? Uh, tell us a little bit about the subject matter. And um, uh, oh, we should mention Liz, Liz Garbus uh, and 
there was another director. Jenny Karchman. Jenny Karchman, or the directors of The Fourth Estate. Always want to try to give credit where credit's due, um, especially to editors. Um, okay, Brian, tell us about Narco Cultura, um, uh, the director, and um, the approach you guys took to the material. Sure. Uh, so, Narco Cultura, it's uh, directed by Shawol Schwartz, and we're longtime collaborators. Um, Originally started working with him on uh, short form pieces that we were doing for Time Magazine. He's originally a contract photographer with Time before transitioning into video and then film. Uh, so this was his first feature. And um, the, the whole project actually came out of a short that we did for Time originally um, about this brand of uh, Mexican and Mexican-American uh, music that was glorifying the narco uh, lifestyle, the, um, glorifying the cartels and, and telling their stories as kind of a modern day bard uh, situation. And so the film follows uh, two narrative threads. One is a uh, crime scene investigator in Juarez, Mexico, as he's um, going about picking up bodies and bullets um, in, in one of the center places of the, the drug war. And uh, the other uh, storyline which we'll see in the sample scene is uh, with a singer uh, with a Mexican-American band from LA uh, and they sing these songs that um, it's akin to gangster rap where they're like bragging about um, you know their, their, car their particular cartel and, and killings and um, you know tales of, of the drug war and so these two storylines um, are evolving in parallel throughout the film the scene comes in um, kind of the, the final act of the film, maybe three-fourths of the way through. Um, and we called this kind of the facing the monster moment when um, Edgar, the, the head of this band, goes to um, Sinaloa, to the, the place, to Culiacan, where the Sinaloa cartel is based, um, and does kind of a tour. They, they're playing music and, and following along with um, an actual narco. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of a tricky line to figure out what level of information we um, were able to uh, expose, um, given the, the safety of the people involved and the, the, the filmmakers. And um, so, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more afterwards, but... I want to I mention two story points that might inform our, our viewing of this scene. Uh, uh, only a little bit earlier in the film, he's, we see him driving in his car in Los Angeles and his baby's in the back, or his son, maybe two or three is in the back seat in the car seat and he's saying, uh, he's telling us that I don't, I don't do cocaine, I don't do meth, I don't get messed up with that stuff, just weed all the time, I just smoke weed, that's all I do. It's just one point to know. And then um, the other thing is, oh, he's been talking, he's been telling us he really wants to go to Mexico and like see what, he, he gets paid by these guys to write songs about them and glorify them, but now he really wants to go to Mexico and like see it firsthand so he can write better songs. All right, let's watch it. At first, I was going to ask you. Um, I can't believe he let you film him like doing the coke or whatever. And then, but then that I can't believe he let you show him being such a bad shot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he, he probably didn't have approval over that. But um, so some of the challenges in this. One of them included. Uh, you mentioned to me that the, there was a lot of footage of them driving and the the guy on the say left side of the car in the back seat uh, who was from Mexico or lives in Mexico uh, did a lot of talking. Oh, and, and that, that initially, he, he, what was it? He didn't want to be in the film or you guys weren't sure? Yeah, so um, this whole setup was like a pretty daring um, shoot to go on. You know, we, we had strung out much of the film already before this was the last, this whole trip was the last thing that was shot. Um, and it, it came out of a feeling in the edit room that we needed these storylines to converge somehow, to cross, that it couldn't just be the, the music side of things. It seemed like all fun and games, um, you know, these guys acting like rock stars and, uh, and, then, and then seeing the, re you know, cutting back and forth between that and the reality of the drug war in Mexico. Um, it felt like they, they weren't meeting. Um, so when it came up that Edgar 
had been wanting to go back to Mexico or go to Mexico. He's American, um, and uh, potentially go on this trip. We kind of nudged that along, um, and then in going, the you know the, there there was like a personal connection with one of the band members that we kind of had to take out of the movie because um, they they would be talking about that. Um, and the the main guy, the the older gentleman, the red polo, he. Um, kept saying, I, I don't want to be in the film, I don't want to be in the film, you know, don't shoot me, don't shoot me, you know, okay, to, to Shaul. And Shaul's, you know, um, a badass photojournalist who's been in every war zone, disaster zone, so he, he's, um, he's got ice in his veins. But, um, you know, he, he just kept shooting, and then it was in the edit room that we were deciding, okay, how much can we actually show of this guy? And Shaul was of the opinion that, well, you know, he kept saying don't shoot, but he just couldn't help but keep bragging about himself and this is our territory and here's, you know, how much meth I have and this is, you know, he was he was showing that off. So, um, ultimately we decided to, you know, not blur his face, keep him in it. We we did blur out, you know, um, the license plates and uh, other like specific identifiers, but to to show him was felt important to establish um, kind of the, this this culture of impunity that that existed there, um, and so uh, the reason I brought this clip though was that it it was um, an exercise in taking a, a ton of footage, a lot of raw verite, and finding those little nuggets in each uh, little vignette that would further our story to to say something about this situation, both. Um, how Edgar, as an excited Mexican American, was you know encountering this for the first time, and 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 his his take on it, and then also just the the background of okay, here is this territory where the cartels are really in charge, um, and and to, to hint at that danger um, in a way that you know wouldn't get us into trouble, but would would show that this was like a real this was a real narco that they were talking to. Uh, and so, um, yeah, each, each little vignette, you know, was pulled from a much longer set of footage. So in, in particular, that, uh, that car scene, you know, they were on the road for a long time, shooting the shit about all sorts of things. Um, and it was this one line that at first, you know, couldn't even really hear what he was saying, um, you know, when he says, you know, even the dogs don't bark at us here. And you know, my Spanish, I can I can follow along with basic Spanish, but certainly not, um, you know, over the car rumble and and they're they're using a lot of slang. You know, I learned all the all the Mexican slang for AK-47 and and bazooka as well while working on this project. But um, but that was that was a little line that you know we're like, what, what did he say right there? And it's like, oh, even the dogs don't bark at us here. I was like, oh, that that you know shows his power. Um, and you know when he's bragging about, oh, this is all our territory. It's so peaceful here. You know, you, the the implication is, oh, it's peaceful because of um, the cartel's grip on power in in, in that part of the country. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was it was fun to go in and and try and pick out those moments that would that would get us there. Um, even though you know originally the string outs would have many little moments. You know, the, the Edgar is. Constantly singing, you know, he's, and the lyrics are often like really useful. I'm like, oh, he's singing about, he's singing about cooking meth, like perfect, uh -huh. like that all, you know, that 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 relates to the plot. Um, but finding finding those little moments and stringing it together in a way that it feels like we're kind of peeking in and just experiencing it as it unfolds, but in reality, it was you know pulled from many days of shooting. Right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I want to keep talking about that film. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. We're probably out of time, but I'd like to open up just to a couple questions. Um, if people have them. So here's one in the second row. Here, I'll give you this mic. This is going to sound like I'm asking a technical question, but I really do mean it as an art and storytelling kind of question. But it's about the idea of, in documentary, when you use on-screen titles to identify people or things. Um, and it's something I'm struggling with with the doc that I'm finishing right now because you know, obviously in a very cinema verite doc, you don't see titles. We're just in it, we're living it, but mine is very archival. And so I guess in some ways my question's probably more for you, Anne, than the others based on these clips. 
how do you find that balance between trusting the audience to just be in the world versus feeling like they would understand the world better if they knew what this was a picture of or what this moment was or who this person was. Um, how do you all find that balance in the storytelling? I try to use graphics as little as possible, although I have to say I love the graphics in this film, which were not made by me. They were made by imaginary forces, including that wonderful crazy lady typing, you know, with things scratched out, that title sequence with the prisms on it. Um, I, I like to believe that my audience is following along and I like to only use them. I identify people if it's the kind of project where, um, you know, like you have a countdown and you have days and things like that that are adding to your story. It's building the tension and it's building the narrative. So I try to only use them in ways that are building the narrative and not in ways that are saying, you know, this is a frog, this is a tree. You know what I mean? good example of that in your film is that you, you guys chose not to identify the books that were being quoted and read from throughout. You right. said it at the end. We did not. Now, there's another reason for that. That's because she wrote the essay in 1962. She put it in the collection of essays that was published in 1983, renaming it, and like she renamed her work. All, it was like her work, and she did it whatever she wanted. Or she would be talking about... Like she talks about her childhood in a book that she wrote in like 2008. So and we then we're just try we're trying to keep up and follow the dates exactly. and we're getting confused and it doesn't exactly. matter. Exactly, and we weren't using the books in order and right. sometimes I think I even smushed two books together in the same sentence. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, but it plays as if we are just trusting you to know. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that goes a long way to answer your question, to just trust you know, that people know what who John F. Kennedy is, or people know whatever, you know what I mean? Unless it's really telling your story. That's, that, I think, is a really good use of a graphic. I, there's a producer that, I, this, is a really, this is a really helpful hit, tip that I was given, a, a, but basically, there's a producer I know, I don't think she'll mind me, it's Julie Goldman, uh, who's a really wonderful producer, and she has, a, she has a way to sort of get to what you're talking about, and I think she agrees with all of us, that less is more with the stuff, but she every time she's watching a cut of whether it's her own movies or somebody else's, she writes down every time that there's a uh, on-screen uh, graphic. And if you do that, <clears throat> I don't know if this is why she does it, but it really helps you. Just imagine for a viewer the, what it takes to process that information that's coming on screen. What you're saying to the viewer is, this is really important because you have to stop watching this movie and read something. So I think that by just well, as you're watching it, writing it down really is like a good way of. And then by the time you get to the end of it, you're like, oh my gosh, I have a ton of text on this thing. What can I what can I strip out? So I thought that was a really good idea that Julie once told me. So. And we have time for one more question. But Brian, you have um, in your film, you really have to. You're, we're going back and forth between Mexico and Los Angeles a lot, and even other other cities because the the musicians are traveling. So. Um, I'm sure you guys were like, God, there's too much. Where can where can we pull them back? But there's times where you you just you had to. I would have been lost. Yeah, I mean, er earlier on in the film, it's it was more important to kind of identify when we're in Juarez versus we're in LA, and and there were some on-screen graphics to like illustrate that in the beginning. You know, actually drawing out uh, a borderline in this wide shot of um, El Paso and and Juarez. Um, but as the film went on, you know, you can kind of start to use more more shorthand, um, and you know, we tried to tweak the color palette as well to to reflect when you're in different places, and um, yeah, hopefully, you know, the, the viewer can be trusted at some point to to understand what you've set up. All right, one more. Sorry, right there, sir. When you're working on. When you're working on a project for like a really long time and um, you know, you're always trying to balance, like when you're using formal interviews, you want it to be about the behavior of the subject. You don't jo just want it to be information. Same with Verite. Any information should also, you should feel something while you're watching it. But as you go along and you like become more and more immersed in the subject, you become an expert in the subject, how do you separate yourself from your own expertise on that subject that you develop through working on the film and take a step back and determine how much does the audience need to know, and how much am I like overloading them? How you know, and how do you balance that with the the other stuff that makes film special, which is the feeling of something, the behavior, the, the all the other stuff. You know, does that make sense? Well, I think one of the things that happens 
when you're collaborating with a director, with a good director, is that you have conversations, and the conversations are very abstract, and the conversations really start to outline narrative um, shapes, you know, beginnings, middles, ends, but, you know, when you're having that conversation, you're saying something like, so here they're feeling like they're really scared and they don't know what's gonna happen, and then we cut to that, you know, the way you're talking about things in an abstract way, allows you to know how much information you need. I hope that that makes sense. You know, I'm always sort of saying, okay, so then it's almost like, it's like a horror movie, and I might be saying that in the middle of a film that's nothing like a horror movie, and then they're going down and down and down, and it's calling them, it's calling them, it's calling them, and boom, you know, you're looking for those shapes, and that kind of curbs you right there, or what what's the hero's journey of this film, if there is one, and you start articulating that and naming, you know, what your scenes or what your moments are that plug into storylines like that. Um, the other thing I like to do if I'm feeling like I'm too close is I do an output and I upload it to Vimeo and I watch it, like, in my house, you know, at home. Um, sometimes if I'm working too much and I don't get to go home, I stand in the doorway of the cutting room and I watch the film from the hallway to see how it feels because it's like, you know, you get, you know, when you're sitting in front of your computer, your synaptic gaps get kind of hardwired. So I do things to make it feel different. Also bringing somebody, kind of anybody, into the room. They don't even have to give you feedback afterwards. You immediately feel the energy. So screenings as much as, like, I would like to cut the whole film and drag it into the trash and never screen it. But screenings are really, really hard. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Screenings are, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> screening, <laughs> uh, screenings are really helpful. And you just, when I screen for a small group or a large group, I just feel for the energy. I just feel to see where it's boring and where it's not. And then when the lights come up, they tell me where it was boring and where it wasn't. That, and that's really helpful too. Yeah, I really agree with that. The, the um, whenever you screen it for an audience, like it, it's just night and day, you know, you could be wa watching the exact same thing, but as soon as a person's in the room, you can like, you, you can feel, you can feel their boredom like very clearly. Yeah. Um, and you can feel when they're like sitting on the edge of their seat and like, and, and you feel in yourself as well, but something about the energy. The other thing I was gonna say is um, in terms of mapping out the energy of a cut, um, I usually keep some sort of spreadsheet or you know note cards you know for for the whole scene map, and then if it's in a spreadsheet, I'll have another another column that's kind of like my little notes for each scene to be like okay like like you were saying like okay here's like a succession of four scenes where like we're feeling down 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 the character is getting beaten down and then like we got a rising moment when like they they feel some redemption and so you can kind of see visually the the ebb and flow of the energy. Um, and that, that really helps to kind of, for me to see it visually, you know, separately from the, the actual edit timeline. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you guys so much, Matthew, Anne, Brian. Thanks, and thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you.